Ilaria, I'm just gonna uh, say a few things uh, just to welcome uh, everyone uh, and to uh, to say welcome back to most of uh, most of you that are joining. This is uh, our third iteration of Pensiero Plurale. Uh, Pensiero Plurale is a series uh, um, of programs that is curated by Ilaria Conti that um, uh, that I'm very excited to. Uh, uh to to have back with us after a few months the last one was uh was the fall and we we wish we were be able to uh, to do this event live hopefully the next one will be uh but at the same time i'm i'm glad like digitally we can connect so many people uh on on on, on a topic that is so important uh like the one of today pensiero plurale uh, is a series that focuses on cultural and social justice and the arts across italy and the united states the event for today, uh, the, the, the title of today's event is uh, on the politics of visibility. And we're very pleased to be joined by an incredible group of artists, curators, writers, and academics who will address uh, present day politics of representation in the arts and relating to Italy. We're very proud to be hosting this event and to continue with this series that I hope will be the last one digital and have you all a magazine or somehow an hybrid so that we can keep uh, our especially Italian friends like uh, uh, participating to it. Um, I will pass now the, I will pass it to Ilaria to begin. And I wanna thank all uh, of you for joining us again, just for you to know the event is recorded, will be posted online uh, later on on our website. But I do hope for a great conversation uh, at the end of it and throughout uh, the presentations. Uh, grazie mille uh, to Ilaria. It's, uh, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Vittorio. And uh, thanks to Magazzino, as always, to his staff, Chiara, Carolina, to its founders, Nancy and Giorgio. And very importantly, I also want to join Vittorio in thanking Joan, Binta, Alessandra, and Simone for accepting this invitation. I'm very, very happy to have you here. Um, as Vittorio was saying, today's event is part of a multi-year series that uh, we've been developing in collaboration with Magazzino titled Pensiero Plurale. And this is a project that uh, for those who might be joining this series for the first time, emerged from the will to create a space for conversation around contemporary art practices committed to social and cultural justice relating to or rooted in Italy. And this need someone stems from the fact that in recent years, there's been a very important emergence and rise of critical discourses and practices centered on these topics in the context of Italy, but not much conversation has been developed yet on this in a more international context. So this series really aims to broaden the reflections on contemporary art and social justice in connection to Italy, and also forge hopefully new exchanges with the context of the United States, which ultimately is where Magazzino is based and operates. And of course, with today's event, we want to honor the fact that February is um, Black History Month, but we also aim to cultivate this approach beyond the scope of one month per year. And so that is why we've been working through a twice a year format that will gain intensity and hopefully, as Victoria will, uh, said, will become an in-presence uh, type of event, really to give continuity to the conversations and reflections that the series wants to cultivate. Um, the core question of today's program really is um, about um, what um, sort of when thinking about social and cultural justice and contemporary practices in, in Italy, through Italy, who and what is made visible and why, and also which practices bring other positionalities, other perspectives into a space of visibility. So this is why we invited four amazing artists, curators, thinking thinkers that really work on these issues to learn more about their practices and through their practices also have a broader conversation on these subjects. So in doing so, what we want to achieve through this hour and hour and a half that we will spend together was to create another moment to discuss project that reflects on Italy's historical past and colonial amnesia, as well as on present day forms of social and cultural injustice. So, through this moment of shared conversation, what we hope to bring forth is really a series of endeavors that are rooted in critical thinking and that uh, embody tangible practices of visibilization at the theoretical, curatorial, and artistic levels. And we did so by inviting speakers whose 
diverse practices allow for this conversation to become somewhat of a mosaic that really helps us understand and articulate further the different methodologies and standpoints um, to these questions. So as always, I will not introduce the speakers so as to give them the space to introduce themselves in their own words and through their own agency. <clears throat> Each of them will generously share a 15 minute presentation on a particular aspect of line of research of their work. And then after that, we will have a moment for communal conversation. And we will also take questions from the public through the Q&A um, function of the webinar. So I wanna thank again, everybody who's been joining and who's here with us today. I wanna to encourage everyone to just uh, write their questions in the Q&A section of the webinar right away as they come to mind and not wait for the end of it. We will address them at the end, but it's good to have them in front of us as we move through the conversation. So um, I'm gonna wrap it up here and I'm gonna leave it to the first speaker, Alessandra Ferrini. Alessandra, thanks so much again, and I pass it on to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Laria, and thanks Magazzino and all the staff for this invitation and making this possible. And also, it's wonderful to be in conversation with Joanne, which I have never met before, uh, being Tensimone, actually, I know quite well. So, um, yeah, thank you. And I'll give you a bit of introduction about certain aspects of my practice, and then I will delve into a specific work, which is very recent, hasn't really uh, been discussed publicly yet so much uh, uh, and that's why I thought it would be interesting to, to start to talk about it because uh, you know you produce something and then you know it, that's the digestion period and then you start to kind of understand better what it's doing and what you're aiming to kind of do with that foot forward in the future and so first of all I will share my screen um, there we go so um, yeah, just as an intro, just let you know, just to say that I work, I'm based, in, I'm based in London, I've been based in London for almost two decades, which is a very long time. This is where I, uh, uh, my formation, uh, you know, that I undergone, you know, all here in London. So I always say that I'm a sort of insider, outsider towards the Italian uh, context. So I do work on questions that relate to Italy history, specifically uh, colonial imperial, imperial history and present, uh, but I'm doing it always from this sort of removed position that and I'm still I'm Italian I you know I was educated in Italy until high school uh, and then eventually I, I I undergone a kind of um, I studied fine art and visual culture and now I'm doing a, a PhD in London so my practice is very much shaped by my uh, my work in, in between academia and practice, but also uh, pedagogy because I, I work for a long time in museum and gallery education. So I do work across and this image here that these two images are what my PhD is based on and is it was for me a way to show you how very much my work is trying more and more to look at the continuities of the colonial past and not just looking at uh, at the past and what happened uh, and events but how these events uh, reverberate and how they still shape the present uh, so it very much is it's about the archive that, that I call and we call with other colleagues the archive of coloniality rather than a colonial archive. And this is to really highlight its continuities and this, um, this long durée of the, of the colonial system and how really it shapes Italy as a national state because it does begin right at the beginning of the formation of the Italian uh, national identity. And from this research, which is still in progress, which is called Gaddafi in Rome, uh, as you can see the, in the image, you have Gaddafi uh, and uh, former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi shaking hands in Rome. And um, this e black and white image, which is an image of um, Omar al Mukhtar, the leader of the um, resistance against the Italian occupation of Libya. And um, so this is the black and white images from 1931, and the color images from 2009. While researching this, I came across a monument in let's see yes in uh, Turin which is a monument to the um, Carabinieri which is the, the um, armed uh, armed forces in Italy 
and uh, it has this uh, effigy of uh, what we think there's, you know, and Dr. Alessandro Volterra believes uh, might have been uh, Omar al Mukhtar. So while I was working on this work, which is called Sight and Sin, and it's a short film, uh, I um, in Turin, I ended up being commissioned a public art project around monuments and statues, which is something I I do deal in my work quite a bit looking at kind of collective memory and you know memorialization practices as well and and more and more actually looking at resistance practices as well so um, i'm quite interested in that and the sort of agency that also individuals um, have in resisting systems and structures um, so but obviously my work is um, is very much done through my own positioning obviously i'm in white i'm italian i live in the uk so i do benefit of a certain system that allows me as well to do certain kind of long-term research, for instance, by benefiting from a full uh, scholarship here to do practice-based research, which in Italy, and maybe is something we could pick up later, but it's something that doesn't really uh, exist uh, so far. So this obviously uh, understand, you know, that I, I have a, the privilege of, of having this, um, this infrastructure that allows me to do this kind of work. But also I have, obviously been in in and out has its benefits and its limitations and, and issues as well by not being you know fully present and not always in constantly you know um understanding the the context uh, fully but obviously uh, i do spend a lot of time in italy and more and more and i work a lot in italy so i feel like i catch up on a lot of um, issues in the last five or six years and but also being based abroad gives me sometimes the benefit of being able to take certain positions that uh, because I you know I am based somewhere else and you know I I do not rely solely on Italy for an income for instance. So I think these are all questions that are at the back of the work, but somehow I try to problematize or kind of um, inform the work somehow and even in, in terms of how I use budgets for instance collaborations or you know creating networks and so on and then as I said before another element is pedagogy and I'll come back to that uh, in a minute but the project I want to talk to you about today is um, this project that I was commissioned after I presented Sight and Sing, which is a public art project. And it's definitely not the way, way I'm used to work. I work in film, video, installation. Um, I, you know, I do not, uh, I make very, very kind of layered uh, works with a lot of documents and so on. So it became quite, and I use found material. And so to me, translating this in a very short time as well. And again, these are all details that we don't really talk about so much, but you know, when are you commissioned and the kind of terms, uh, you know, time you have to do the work makes a great difference when your work is very, you know, why any work, but obviously as well, if you are relying on kind of long-term research, then, uh, you know, how, you know, this, let's say that the uh, production, the, the way the art, system and production system works and doesn't always uh, marry the kind of research side very well so how do you uh, come up with solutions to do that uh, uh, so in this case i was asked to do um oh yeah sort of site specific public art project in turin and i chose to work on um parco del valentino which is the main park in, in you know the, in cent the center of turin uh, along the river Po, and it's a, a, for me it was an easy choice because I, I was looking for quite a bit at um, the role of Turin. Turin was the very first Italian capital, uh, no, sorry, the second, you know, every time I get confused, the first <laughs> Florence and Rome, and, um, and actually, um, but also um, what I'm interested more and more, let's say, is to highlight how colonialism is something that starts with the, with the construction of the Italian nation state and not relegating it always in the same kind of box with fascism because obviously fascism accelerated and sort of um, heavily invested in it and, and the, the brutality that fascism uh, that, that was unleashed during fascism in the colonies was, um, was you know, very, very um, high and, you know, very, um, intense but the, the question is the the imperial drive does 
start much earlier and the, the colonial um, possessions begin much earlier. And I think to me, this is something very important to kind of remind us as, as Italian, as Italian national state, trying to understand, again, the continuities, but also how rooted this is in uh, uh, constructing the Italian whiteness and the Italian identity. And so for this work, I mostly, um, again, talking about budgets, as I mentioned before, I had quite a high production budget, very short timing to produce. Uh, and I and uh, so I ended up uh, collaborating and producing an audio piece. So actually it's a sort of audio book, it's four different uh, pieces, uh, audio tracks uh, within that they're scattered throughout the park. And they were made in collaboration with Marta Gabriel Antesfou, who's a, a friend collaborator that um, has been, we've been working together since being part of the same uh, research center in, in Padua, there's uh, a girl called Intergrades, uh, um, as said, is a research group uh, focused on race and racism in Italy. And, uh, and also with Marco Stefanelli, who's an audio producer and with, and, we work together in making these audio pieces um, and I worked with him in the past as well. So uh, the question was how to uh, tackle the, the park. The park was the site of international uh, exhibitions and, and the expos uh, during the first, actually during the first 100 years of Italian history. So uh, in particular, actually I changed the slide, but this, uh, this shot here is a postcard from 1911. And 1911 for me became a very important year. It's more and more present in my reflections and work because it's when Italy, it's the 50th anniversary of Italy, of Italian, um, unification and it's in the same year that Italy occupied Libya and uh, there's a lot of effort as well in sort of reclaiming Italian migration as well because there was such a you know a, a large migration from Italy in that large diaspora and of course we are talking in, in online but you know in a space based in the states so this story is very present uh, and because of the mass in my, uh, migration, um, there was an attempt to reclaim it. And in this case, in 1911, for instance, the all the pavilions uh, of Southern America, you know, of um, South American countries uh, were called the uh, free colonies, for instance. So, so they were reclaimed as Italian colonies, even though actually, you know, there were uh, people who migrated there, but of course, always with the privilege, the white privilege, and with certain kind of, um, you know, relations with the uh, um, with the fatherland that that stayed on and allow you know for the exploitation of local resources and so on. So we focused on this time with Magda. We did a lot most of the research, and also Magda worked. Uh, very closely, we we look at different um, monuments and you know how we related this conversation to do with sort of memorization practices and how you kind of navigate the space and what you know around you. But also we had different kind of layers in the in the in the audio tracks to sort of um, you know open up sort of uh, imagination as well. But to me, what was important in this case was to make a work that even after the exhibition, it could stay. And that was what I meant in terms of using how you use a budget as well. It's not making something that would stay up for a month and then it'll be taken down. And now we are working on to make it permanent actually. Um, so we're working with the uh, council in Turin at the moment to, to sort of make this work permanent. So that was very much my uh, hope that the work, all this work or that you know, we put together wouldn't just be for a one-off and would have a, an afterlife. Um, and also there was the question of being able to talk directly with the audience that the audio uh, guide gave, gave us the possibility to do and to have this very intimate uh, conversation where we could really focus on making the audience uh, reflect on, on the, the, the construction of national identity and who we are now and how it relates to this moment in time and the exposition and in particular and then I'll, I'll Wrap up. We focused on uh, Magda, uh, developed um, 
the we, we did you know the, the work the audio tracks has got different voices mostly me and then Magda has worked on uh the, this track which was very delicate was the most sensitive uh question when we started to work and you know a lot of the thought the the process been behind on how to do this which is uh there is we tackled the question of the human zoos in Italy, because here in uh, Parco del Valentino, there was the very first human zoo in Italy, where six people from the Bay of Astab, the very first possession, Italian uh, colonial possession in the 1880s, let's say, was uh, were brought uh, to, to, to Turin and put on display. And the question was obviously not to show any images, but to focus on this narration. And um, and to focus on the space itself and and the, and the changes. So I'm just gonna say it's one minute, and then I'm gonna pass on the mic uh, to Joanne, I believe. Um, so let, hopefully you can hear. Il giardino che vedi aprirsi davanti a te era molto diverso nel 1884. La recinzione che oggi produce questo senso di oasi separata dal resto del parco non esisteva. Anche la conformazione del terreno era diversa. Al posto della piccola collina sulla destra vi era uno spiazzo erboso che ospitava però un'altra sorta di recinzione. La recinzione del 1884, come quella che vediamo oggi, aveva l'obiettivo di tenere separati due spazi. Ma a differenza di questo secondo, il recinto non fu ideato per creare una zona protetta, ma per costruire un palcoscenico. Questo palcoscenico serviva a mettere in scena l'alterità più assoluta, per mostrare tutto ciò che l'Italia e gli italiani non erano ciò che non erano, ma che potevano conquistare, addomesticare ed esporre, a dimostrazione della superiorità della razza italica. Ok, so just to, to finish, well at the moment this is in Italian only, but we are trying to uh, translate it and make it available as a online kind of video so at least the, the, the audio can uh, have, again have another afterlife and we're working on a project with uh, high school as well to make more of these guides uh, still with Magda and, and Marco Stefanelli and I'm gonna leave it there and thank you for you know, your attention. Alessandra, thank you so very much. This is wonderful. And thank you also for sharing a little bit of the work which really brings it to life, I hope for everybody. Um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Joanne. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, Ilaria and Magazzino and the director, thank you for this invitation. I'm really glad to be here with you today and to have this opportunity to share um, my work. I'm Joanne Africo. I'm an independent curator and cultural producer, and uh, I'm the founder and CC director of Bliot Meg and Spazio Glio, which is uh, both an online media platform, uh, editorial platform, and also uh, a nomadic space that platform and fosters um, multidisciplinary experimentation, exploration, and discussion uh, through arts and culture. I launched Glio in 2015. Uh, I always been very um, concern since I was a child about how I was represented and depicted in mainstream media or, or, or I wasn't <laughs> depicted and uh, represented in mainstream media but as well as in um, art and culture in general. Uh, also having a, uh, a family that is uh, rooted in uh, many different countries both uh, in the Caribbean and also in the US, in the US, specifically in uh, New York. Uh, every time that I went there to visit them, I was really overwhelmed by this fullness and uh, something that I miss here in Rome, in Italy. And uh, I specifically uh, compare Rome to New York because, and not, and, and don't mention Haiti, uh, which is um, uh, my country from my maternal side, uh, because I'm mostly interested for this specific uh, conversation to make a comparison between uh, two um, city 
predominantly white. So every time, uh, as I was saying, uh, I was uh, in New York, also in London or in uh, Paris, I was always overwhelmed by this fullness. And there was uh, a moment in my life that I wanted to like move to emigrate in another country like uh, the US. Um, but at a certain point I say, okay, I question myself, uh, if I want to stay here, what can I do? And uh, the, the answer was uh, Griot. And um, if uh, Chiara could share one of the video about uh, um, the experts video, There was not uh, there was not the audio bodies okay this is uh, an example of uh, what I was saying before um, I mean um, uh, I needed to create something uh, and all those things that make me feel comfortable in my skin when I when I used to go out or when I go out when I visit museum when I visit uh, or attend shows uh, and when I watch TV and uh, this was a, a contemporary dance and video art performance that um, I curated for the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Inter International Cooperation that tour in uh, from uh, Addis Ababa to Johannesburg and uh, Dakar. And this is a response of what I mean when I say to put our bodies, Italian bodies on the stage, uh, both, uh, both on the stage uh, than uh, behind the scene. So when I founded Grio, uh, actually I was really uh, driven by a personal need uh, to create uh, a different space, a space that could amplify and uh, share, uh, could, uh, yeah, that could amplify our representation, that could um, in a way counteract uh, and uh, uh, parts and stereotypical narratives surrounding our bodies. And, um, and of course that could also amplify um, underrepresented and invisibilized uh, voices and bodies. And uh, a space of course of gathering and conviviality. And uh, since the beginning, uh, I remember at the time that uh, I launched Griot, I was really um, concerned about writing because uh, actually I'm not academically tra trained in uh, writing, not in curating. I can say that um, I create from the ground up, from the basis. So it's really uh, an experimenting process uh, since the beginning uh, and I'm graduating international and cooperation development uh, I have um, uh, also uh, I don't know if you say master in uh, digital uh, marketing uh, from the, the business school of Sole Ventipatroi because I also uh, felt at the time uh, that it was necessary for me for a platform uh, to have the knowledge the skills to to, to amplify um, the narrative that I wanted to see and to read on uh, on media and uh, on on uh, on other uh, platforms, and um, I used to work uh, before uh, launching Rio as a project manager and um, a coordinator for different creative agencies and uh, also on um, no profit organization. Um, but every time that I work in this project, I always saw that there wasn't my body. And uh, I think, um, no, I speak purposely uh, about my past experience because uh, uh, what you see uh, about Rio is uh, very tied uh, with my past experience. I mean, uh, uh, when I found the Grio, I, I always uh, knew that uh, I was not about to just writing on a magazine, but to like uh, put my experience 
in an in the entire process. Uh, so that's why also I'm in a way capable of running uh, uh, a space uh, that could propose artistic projects uh, and uh, performing projects and so on. Uh, if uh, uh, Chiara uh, can share, yes, the document that is a very sh yeah quick document. So yeah, this is the first page. You can go on. So as I said, uh, Grio is both a magazine and uh, a space, uh, and we have different formats uh, that runs from editorials, interview, opinion, reviews, and documentary series, uh, and also public program, uh, visual and performing arts, music. Uh, these are some, uh, in the next pages, you can see all the, um, Yes, so this is the first uh, uh, event uh, public, uh, in the public program section that uh, we curated in collaboration with the American Academy in Rome. And it was organized within uh, their exhibition called uh, Black on White, Nero su Bianco. And uh, it was a specific highlights on uh, the first highlights on Afro-Italians in the arts today uh, with uh, four uh, Italian uh, with a, 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 a plural background. The next. Okay, this was a very interesting and amazing panel uh, that was called Sangue Misto, Mixed Blood, Sound Identity and Representation. In this occasion, uh, we um, involved six different musical artists uh, to share their uh, vision about uh, how the music scene um, didn't represent uh, Black artists uh, in the music scene. So we were trying to, to find uh, the solution on how to be visible. Yeah, next. This is uh, our last event uh, after we, we've been hit by the coronavirus. This is the first public event uh, uh, after two years of stop. It was uh, organized in collaboration with the Castello di Rivoli Muse Museum of Contemporary Art and uh, at the Circolo dei Lettori in Turin. It was the book release of uh, Grada Quilomba, international uh, interdisciplinary artist uh, and author. And uh, yeah, in this occasion, we had a talk with the artist uh, about the book, uh, about her practice, and also about the exhibition that is having uh, in uh, the next couple of months, maybe. Next. Uh, yeah, some pictures. Here's there's also Magda, the colleague of um, Alessandra Ferrini, that was with me on the stage uh, translating uh, Grada's words. Uh, this is a very this is my first project uh, yeah, as a cultural producer, and I'm very attached to this project because uh, it, it is really uh, related to what I said before about uh, not feeling. Uh, um, to not feeling to be represented in mainstream media and uh, to be invisibilized and uh, to live in a country that uh, see and depicts itself uh, still as a white country. And this, this was my first attempt to say, uh, Italy is not only a white country, but we are here, we exist. Uh, and I call this um, series The Expats uh, because uh, I remember at the time in 2015, I was reading an article on The Guardian called Why White People Are Expats While the Rest of Us Are Immigrants. Uh, and so I played with many layers with the term expat uh, and who is deemed to be called expat, who is deemed to be called immigrants. But at the same time, I also use abroad as a word because we always feel to be, you know, like being uh, foreign. <laughs> so to always live uh, abroad of our country. And uh, if we have time later, I would really love to show you the, the teaser, the trailer of this uh, um, series because uh, it's very interesting. And um, it was a series that was really acclaimed by the media. Uh, next. Oh, these are a series of documentaries uh, shot between uh, yeah, London, Rome, uh, Milan, Rome and Milan. And uh, yeah, also this is a this this is an attempt to uh, say this is the TV that we really want to have. This is the people that we really want to to see on uh, on uh, mainstream media. Of course, uh, it's more uh, focused on contemporary art and music uh, and uh, and uh, acting. Uh, but yeah, next. 
Yeah, these two series, uh, uh, other two documentary series, uh, realizing collaboration with the Italian Cultural Institute of Dakar and uh, Addis Abeba, uh, that um, highlights the presence uh, of uh, Italian, uh, in this case, uh, Italian Senegalese, in the other case, uh, Italian Ethiopians. Uh, and I was really happy to work on this project because uh, I saw an attempt also by the Italian Cultural Institute of, uh, um, yeah, of other countries, uh, to highlight the presence of uh, uh, this Italy, this contemporary Italy. Next, mirrors the video that we saw before. Okay, this is another artistic project uh, called Listening Memories, Memori in Ascolto. It was realized for the Contemporary Rome Festival uh, in collaboration with Spellbound. And in this occasion, I commissioned um, uh, to four authors of Rio to write a text that uh, was then um, transformed into a reading performance uh, and uh, inside a market hall in Rome and uh, also um, a site-specific video installation in this market. Next, this is the zine. This is the, our first publication of a zine. And the reading performance inside the market. The video installation is was very really interesting and fun and funny because we usually um, we are usually used to 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 see arts in uh, more institutionalized uh, spaces like the white cube, uh, and uh, when I was proposed to um, what kind of spaces do you want to exhibit or to show your work, I decided to 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 show it uh, inside the market. So this is a yeah. This is another um, a way of uh, making the, the visible, the invisible visible. I was invited by Der Grief, uh, which is a contemporary uh, photography organization, uh, to curate an online exhibition in collaboration with an artist of my choice. And I, in that occasion, I chose uh, Silvia Rosi, uh, who is um, an Italian photographer that I really love. Next. This is a, yeah, a selection of uh, the picture that were exhibited online. Next. Okay, this is a takeover a collaboration uh, that uh, we had with Vice in 2016, 17, 2018. We were asked to um, um, write content uh, about uh, uh, racism, uh, identity, and uh, uh, Italian citizenship. Uh, so uh, all the, the theme and the issue and the, uh, that really concern us. And the last one, oh, I can see it. The, the last one is very important because uh, I'm with uh, my the other member of the Grio Collective, uh, Celine Angbelechi, uh, Ewa, and uh, Eric Cotiano Sumba, who are also behind uh, behind Grio Mag. Uh, so all the contents that uh, you can read on Grio and all the projects that we develop and deliver are um, are yeah uh, developed with them. Finished. <clears throat> Thank you so much, John. So I'm going to show now the video that you wanted to have before, but it was oh. still recording, so we couldn't Thank show you. it. Thank you. Thank you, I'm going to launch it, and it's two minutes, so I'm going to let it go for it in its entirety. All right, just so that everybody knows what's going on. <laughs> Un fratello più grande di 4 anni, senza di lui non sarei la persona che sono adesso. La mia infanzia e adolescenza sono state molto belle, non mi lamento assolutamente della città in cui sono cresciuta, ma ricordo che in ogni posto in cui mi trovavo andavo mi sentivo sempre l'unica, sempre un po' diversa, soprattutto quando ho iniziato a vestirmi in modo più alternativo. Ascoltavo veramente di tutto, dal metal, punk, hip hop. 
Grazie alla musica ho imparato a conoscere me stessa, mi ha aiutato a capire che potevo benissimo vivere in qualsiasi modo. Mi sono trasferita a New York perché avevo bisogno di cambiare, di staccare un po' la spina, di crescere. La cosa che mi piace di più di questa città sono le opportunità, i mille colori dei quartieri, i mille vuoti delle persone, la diversità. In Italia mi manca la mia famiglia, i miei amici e il mio quartiere. Sicuramente ritornerò a casa perché ci sono un sacco di cose belle che stanno succedendo e non me le voglio perdere. Comunque per il momento continuo a fare la mia vita e le mie esperienze di lavoro qui. Il mio nome è Sara, ho 25 anni, sono di Milano e questa è la mia storia. Thank you, Joan. Thank you so very much for all of this and for showing us sort of the, how the work has ch changed and expand and expanded over, over the years. Um, I would leave it now to Binta. Hi. Hello. Hello to everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you, Ilaria, for inviting me. Thank you, Magazzino, and thank you. Um, to all the people involved in this conversation. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Second talk. Okay. So, okay, can you see? Yes. Okay, amazing. So um, my name is uh, Dinta and I'm a visual artist based in uh, Milan, in Italy. Um, so for today, I prepared a short presentation with uh, three of my works. Um, and I chose these works because I think that even their differences, they're very connected also with the notions and also the things that we are going to um, uh, in some way develop together uh, in this conversation. Um, so I'm going to start with this one. Uh, this installation is called the Black Powerless 2. Um, and it's a wall installation uh, made um, by 10 pieces, actually. Before um, going on with the detailed description of this work, I would like to jump on uh, Another work actually, which is this one. This work is called uh, Black Powerless, and uh, it's like where I, I mean, where I, yeah, I started to, um, I mean, I started from here to develop the other installation. So this culture, um, Black Powerless, um, reflects on um, explore identities issues as Africanity and Italianity of uh, African Italians. Um, in the social, political, uh, and contemporary Italian context. So when I speak about African Italians, I refer to um, a large part of the second generation um, of children of uh, migrants of the first, yeah, from the first wave actually of migrants in Italy. So uh, these children has to wait, uh, um, have to wait until they're 18 years old in order to obtain their citizenship, applying for it. And um, I'm one of, I am one of these children. So for me, it was very important uh, in some way to explore um, the question of uh, identity starting from this experience, this personal experience. So I decided to, um, mold my my own arm um position as the very famous uh, um symbol of the black power from the 60s um so my power uh, my black power actually is i decided to position it in a, in a, on the contrary 
And uh, this position actually, um, for me, it's very important because uh, in some way underline the fact that um, many, uh, a lot of uh, black uh, entities have no power actually in Italy. So um, the idea of hanging my own uh, arm, my molded arm in that position, uh, in some way try to um, reflect on how um, a large part of the, 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 the country actually um, is still invisibilized and actually made invisible by the nation. So from here also the choice to, um, for example, uh, use the, the, the silicon as a material. So the sculpture is made by silicon, um, a wet material in contrast uh, with the violence and the, con yeah, the, with the consistent violence actually exercised by, by Italy, no? Um, so returning to um, Black Powerless 2, um, as a continuity of this uh, culture, I decided to, to focus on a, um, on a work with more pieces. Um, so the last summer I've been invited uh, for a short residency in Florence by Dustin Thompson, which is an artist, a curator, and um, yeah, an amazing person who's running a space called uh, the Recovery Plan, uh, which is a, a very important space actually for a, uh, black communities in Italy. Um, so during this uh, short um, uh, stay, I I wanted actually to explore and to uh, continue actually with this project. So I asked to be in contact and uh, um, to to be connected actually more with the um, black with the locals black Italians. Um, in order to start new conversations, but also um, for me in this project, for example, it was important not only to talk about my own experience, but also to in, uh, involve um, the diversities of being uh, an African Italian, actually. So um, I basically started uh, um, a formal conversation with uh, 10 people, 10 persons, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, with different uh, ages. So um, I had um, uh, the opportunity to uh, meet, for example, uh, a black woman who's uh, um, involved in um, political campaigns in Florence, for example. Um, I had the opportunity to, to work with uh, the young generation, uh, with people involved in culture, in culture and in art. So for me, it was very important to include uh, different corporal and experiences uh, in, a, in a work that started from uh, my own uh, experience as a Black Italian woman. Um, so, here a detail of, um, of the installation. Okay. Um, so, I'll pass to another work. Uh, and before showing you, the picture of, uh, of the installation, I, I would love to start from this image. Um, an image um, very important for me. I discovered this uh, image uh, during my childhood. I was doing my own research in my, yeah, um, in my computer. I was very curious and um, I found this image. Uh, it shocked me a lot. And um, and then I I decided to uh, in uh, 2019 actually when I was studying fine arts in um, in Grenoble I decided to to do something and to start from this so um, for me it was very important for it also um, to work on this image um, because uh, in Italy for example uh, um, images like this one are still invisibilized and hidden actually. And when I talk about um, these, I refer, for example, on how uh, all these images and all these stories are hidden in school books, for example. No? So I grew up in a country where uh, in my uh, books, there was no reference no, about this story. 
So, um, uh, yeah, I passed to the installation. So the installation uh, title is Chorus for Soil and um, is a reproduction, a uh, large scale reproduction of a slave ship. In part, that is the reproduction of the, the image that I showed you before, the Brooks, uh, an English uh, um, ship. Um, it's an installation made of soil. Um, and um, basically, the installation uh, is like a sort of um, monument um, that try in some way to remember all the women uh, and the men and the, the children um, uh, yeah, that lost their lives during the crossing actually from the continent to the America. Um, but for me, it was very important uh, in this work to enlighten a link between uh, uh, a history anchored in the past, but uh, present in the contemporary. Uh, through the contemporary migration and through the uh, contemporary exploitation of black bodies, actually. Uh, and in this installation specifically, I wanted also to denounce how uh, black bodies are still exploited um, in the fields, actually. So it was very important for me to connect um, the slave trade with these uh, new forms of slavery and in, uh, in the contemporary agriculture, specifically in Italy. Um, so for me, uh, it was very important to use the soil, not only because of this link with agriculture and uh, with the fields, and, but also because it's, uh, it's a material that uh, I'm very connected with this material. Um, I think that it's very symbolic. I mean, there's a lot of symbolism behind this material. Um, I also forget to, to tell you that um, I plant some seeds, in particular melon seeds, because of the connection, of course, of um, uh, the plantations in the southern Italy of Italy. Um, and the title actually for me uh, come out uh, in a natural way. And um, sorry, I forgot to go with the images. Um, when I look at this image, actually, when I look at the image of the ship, I, I hear voices, actually, I hear stories, I, I can smell something. So for me, it was uh, very uh, important to, um, in some way, um, express all this uh, vision that I had when I look at the image for the first time. Uh, so there's also this kind of um, sensorial component no, in the title. Um, and um, so, yeah, this is the last image, sorry. <laughs> and um, as a continuity of this project, I, um, I conceived uh, an audio piece uh, titled The Chorus of Zong. Uh, so Chorus of Zong, it's like a sort of um, um, chorus of voices of um, African, Italian, young women and men. Um, in dialogue with the uh, echoes uh, of the ancestors. So um, basically the idea was to, I actually um, gave them some parts of uh, some poems written by Norbizi Phillips that comes from a uh, um, collection of poems, uh, visual and sound poems um, called Zong. So, um, this work, um, it's an important work because uh, um, it's not only a book, but it's also um, a sort of way of a work of uh, reparative care. Uh, and um, through um, this piece, the author tried to um, recompose the story um, that saw 150 slaves uh, murdered actually by the crew of a ship named Zong. Uh, during the um, um, during the the crossing, no, the crossing of the Atlantic. So um, for me, it was very important uh, to start a conversation, uh, starting from uh, something um, as I mentioned before, anchored with the, the the ancestor, with the past, in order to um, 
to underline the, 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 the link no, between the past and the contemporary. So that's why I decided, I asked some of my friends actually, um, African Italian to, to read part of this poem in order also to, um, to see how uh, we are still struggling and questioning no, about our complexities in terms of identity. So, um, Chiara? Yes, I'll you share right play? now. Yeah. Thank you. Let me know if you have trouble hearing it. Okay, I'm going to start now. Okay, thank you. The truth was. The truth was. The ship sailed. The ship sailed. The, rains the rains came. came. The, the, loss the loss arose. arose. The, loss the truth arose. is. The, the truth sailed. is. The ship sailed. The truth is. The ship sailed. The rains came. The rains came. The loss arose. Need not to be proved. The Negro is another ground. Is not necessary. Appeared impossible. Was justified. Not to be. Has been decided. Not be. It is said. It is said. Was. It is a part of circumstances. Need not be proved. Is another ground. Is not necessary. Appeared impossible. Was justified. Has been decided. He said. Has been decided. Was justified. Appeared impossible. Is not necessary. Is another ground. Need not be proved. Oh, oh. The obras so again ifa the negro bridge the negro bridge thank you so very much binta and i'm just gonna jump right ahead to the last speaker simone the floor is yours thank you so much can you hear me yeah Thank you so much, Hilaria, for inviting me to this panel, and thank you, Mike Zino, for the organization, and also thank you for my for all the colleagues and the other speakers that actually spoke before me. Uh, as Alessandro was mentioning before, I'm really happy also to be here because uh, there is a bond, a friendship bond between Alessandra and Binta. I don't know who I'm personally, so I, uh, I hope it will happen in the future. But um, as we, we were talking about it also with Ilaria in preparing this panel, it's also very important to underline this politics of friendship that goes uh, around certain networks in Italy and uh, nourish uh, very profoundly uh, certain critical discourses that are currently happening and that uh, not always uh, acknowledged. And so I will try to um, highlight certain aspects of my practice, uh, also um, acknowledging the fact that uh, a lot of the evolution of my thinking and of my writing practices and also my curatorial practices come from a very strong dialogue with uh, other practitioners in the country and outside the country, all uh, thinking through Italy. So as we were saying, actually, Italy, instead of being just a like, geopolitical setting, is also a sort of speculative object, a speculative space that helps us to understand certain issues related to especially social justice and how arts can, um, in a way, uh, underpin uh, uh, social movements uh, with other tools. But actually looking at this through Italy, which is a very specific um, situation and struggle and genealogy and political history. I'm saying this because uh, we, there is this uh, transcontinental bridge between Italy and US and actually we uh, always uh, tend to use uh, Anglo-American uh, language, Anglo-American discourse in order to speak about uh, very local histories, for example, in Italy. But actually, I think it's really important also to acknowledge a very specific local uh, and, uh, history of uh, political thinking. Um, so as, I, as you can read in my bio, I am, I am a researcher and a writer and a curator. It has been a journey and that took me to identify with this triple, uh, <laughs> uh, triple actually entities, but actually it really sticks to my work because uh, coming from, I come from an academic background, uh, being trained in philosophy, in continental philosophy, especially phenomenology and uh, with a very specific interest in um, aesthetics and visual cultures. 
uh, and with the real needs of understanding how philosophy can re could really encounter arts and being uh, in a way proven by arts. So this is where my curatorial work started from and I really started to collaborate with artists and write with artists and for artists. So I really come from this history of um, feeling the need of using theory as a form of action instead of just using it as a as a space of solitary uh, speculation and from this it also comes uh, my history of um, work and uh, professionalization in the non-profit fields in Italy so I really had the chance of being formed by a certain uh, histories non-profit histories in Italy that was real um, important aspect of my training because it really uh, set the tone also of my curatorial research. Um, so as I said before, I had the chance of collaborating with Alessandra and Binza in uh, various occasions, actually also this idea that my curatorial practice really try to uh, interact with uh, research-based artistic practices that work in long-term projects and uh, where the discourse is really uh, something that uh, takes a lot of space in, the, in visualization, actually, it's not just with uh, aesthetical productions. I have to say, that, uh, um, in a, speaking generally, I'm really interested in, in visuality uh, and in what actually Jennifer Tolesca calls uh, visual citizenship. So this idea of, as Joanne also was, say, was saying before, what enters and what is left outside the space of, of visibility. Um, so for me, it's really, uh, belongs to a process of visibilization instead of a politics of visibility as something uh, given as such, as a structure. So it's from this standpoint that I tend to look at uh, collaborations and practices also from an institutional level, knowing that actually, as you were saying, Ilaria, a lot of these courses in Italy are taking a lot of space, but uh, there is always the danger of tokenism and always the danger of vampirization of certain identities when we you tackle issues related to, for example, anti-colonial movements or um, to uh, race and racism, critical discourse on race and racism. Uh, this uh, leads me also to say that a lot of my work uh, deals with whiteness and critical whiteness studies, uh, such as Alessandra was mentioned, as Alessandra was mentioned before, because um, I have the impression that in the Italian art scene, expanded art scene, actually a lot of discourse around blackness is uh, happening, which is really, really good, but actually we miss another power, which is a heavy and important and well-structured discourse around whiteness. So I pretty uh, interested in um, understanding how uh, arts can really become a platform uh, through different projects in order to enact these courses and mobilize also uh, fluid perspectives. Uh, not, not always like, like in this idea of not reifying uh, these courses and mainly keeping the discourse ongoing and um, and uh, yeah, working. That's why while we were talking, Ilaria, I, I also um, acknowledge the fact that we are in a very uh, space of transition right now in Italy where uh, the aboutness of the post-colonial discourse, for example, or the aboutness of the anti-racist discourse has to uh, undergo a sort of process of accuracy where actually uh, um, positioning becomes real parts. Of the of the of the work, so I know that uh, Alessandra and Binza work a lot on this and uh, on this area of uh, of the speaker's location, which is something that often as white practitioner we miss because we have been trained in, in a sort of neutral space where everything is allowed and, and nothing is thematized. Um, so um, just to uh, I just wanted to share my screen and mention to. Uh, Uh, this is the end of the yeah so a uh, two projects in which i am long term involved and it's actually this platform which is in france uh, i i am based in milan i live in milan but i have a teaching and research position in the uh, university of arts in grenoble and uh, this is a platform for critical research and political imagination it's actually uh, a platform for uh yeah critical research and political imagination, which is always based on workshops, uh, resident artist residencies, but also festival uh, and events and residencies, all considered as research spaces, not as a sort of, uh, you know, a presentation of concluded projects, but really as something that helps us to think uh, in movement. Um, this is a, 
I collected that I created with my colleague Katja Schneller. Uh, and actually, we have the chance of receiving two years ago uh, a research grant that um, helped us to structure this in a research unit that we decided to call uh, Artistic Hospitality and, and um, Visual Activism for a Diasporic and Post-Occidental Europe. And this is the, the core idea of our research, actually, how uh, practices, artistic practices can really help us to rethink Europe, not in a monolithic perspective as a fortress, but really as um, a space which has been shaped and still shaped by diasporas, internal and external diasporas, and also uh, renounce actually to think from an imperial uh, perspective, as Alessandro was also saying before. Uh, and so this is also important for me as an experience because it really responds to this necessity that I have in my work not to um, singled out theory or like uh, divorce theory from practice and are actually thinking that theory is a practice and as such has different uh, certain protocols which are also physical, certain institutional implications and also um, certain ethical implications such as the use of budgets, such as the redistribution of resources. And uh, so I just say this because also Alessandra mentioned this and also Joan mentioned this about this idea of also going back to the very structural dynamics that um, inform our works. So uh, in this, um, given that I work in a very homogeneous white space in the university, which is like a common situation in people operating in a academic institution in Italy, this platform also allows us to intersect uh, other practices uh, that are not um, institutionalized or supported by institution, but that actually come from, especially for our work, from the Mediterranean uh, area, from the Arab worlds, from uh, Mediterranean Africa, and from um, South America, uh, Latin America. So uh, this is really a, a place where we, uh, a place of, let's say, in, interface uh, of the academic institution with other uh, living practices actually in the uh, global ecosystem uh, uh, responding to a, a common um, a common agenda. The other uh, experience that I want to talk about that it's really uh, in which I'm engaged since 10 years now, this is the 10th edition, is this um, free school of performance that I organized since uh, 10 years at Centrale Fies. Centrale Fies is a non-profit uh, organization for the production and promotion of performing arts in Italy. It was a festival before coming in, becoming an institution, a physical institution. It's a festival that has 40 years of history in the, um, uh, in the uh, Trentino Alto Adige. And actually, uh, Liveworks is a um, it's actually response as a format to this uh, necessity that I have in order to see actually practices in relationship with uh, theories and actually trying to fluidify this idea uh, that position uh, theory and uh, theoretical work uh, in a hierarchical position in respect to artistic practices and actually this idea of how our respective practices, practices can create a sort of uh, collective intelligence. Uh, and so Lightworks is an um, expanded residency. It's very, let's say, promiscuous in terms of uh, uh, formats, a residency where we select six performative projects each, each year that are invited in Centrale Fies to work together in developing their individual project, but also to think together and actually sort of uh, cross-pollinate their practices uh, through different collective formats. Um, the works uh, never reclaimed any kind of aboutness or thematic, but actually we are interested in supporting uh, performative practices that have uh, a very clear social and political agenda using performance and the relationship that performance has with living bodies and moving bodies uh, to um, tackle actually issues related to social justice. And this is also the fact that the, no, the reason why two years ago, uh, together with Magda Gabriel Marian Tespau, who has been quoted several times, uh, several times tonight, we decided to uh, create a fellowship uh, conceived as an affirmative action, especially dedicated to, uh, I, I, I use the term that we used in the open call because it's also very important uh, work that we did on language, on uh, racialized Italian artists. So artists uh, living, working in Italy, 
uh, that actually identify themselves with this uh, conditional work, a social condition. And while, while it was structuring actually this open call in order to, uh, as I said it before, it's, it has been conceived as an affirmative action, so a clearly uh, politically charged agenda, uh, the, we got the news of the brutal uh, killing of Agito del Gudeta, who Agito is a, um, is an uh, Eritrean farmer, Ethiopian farmer, sorry, that were based in the region of Centrale Fies, uh, that actually uh, developed a very uh, enlightened ecological uh, farming activity in the region, and was also actually a, a feminist activist and a very uh, interesting entrepreneur. Uh, and so we were, in a way, driven to dedicate this um, fellowship to, to her and to her practice. And we got in contact with the family because also Agito was uh, providing cheese for the Centrale Fies in the festival. So we really had a connection uh, with this. And so the, the fellowship was created uh, and dedicated to her. We are coming to the, seven, to the second uh, edition this year and the first edition was uh, you know, granted to Silvia Rossi, that was also quoted uh, before. Uh, so these are two projects that I'm involved right now, but I just wanted to do a brief uh, journey into this, into two or if I have the time, I don't know, one minute, uh, into in different projects that actually also saw the collaboration of Alessandra and Binta uh, that helped me to think, to think about uh, yeah, this very intricate and uh, politically charged notion of Italianness. We were talking about actually it before. Uh, Italianness has been uh, severely whitewashed uh, over the course of uh, the Italian history. And actually, uh, it, it has been also uh, assigned uh, to a certain um, uh, class uh, in, in the Italian context. Uh, so, uh, uh, in my recent project, I always try to uh, use uh, curatorial work as a space of assembly of different uh, practitioners in order to question very specific uh, questions. Um, I, I have to say that the first time that I encountered Alessandra's practice was in the occasion of this uh, project. That was the uh, 16th edition of uh, Padre Nale, who is a very... Uh, specific context because it, it's an, it's a, it has been founded by fascism with the aim of representing Italy. It was a really uh, an artistic institution that has a, ha, had a heavy representational task as opposed to the Biennale that was internationalist. So the idea was really, really to focus on Italy and Italians. And when we proposed the project, uh, the first inspiration was uh, Pasolini and Appunti uh, per un'orestia d'Africana. That actually was a, it's a very complex uh, and often overlooked work of Pasolini because also it shows that Pasolini was a uh, uh, third worldist, but at the same time in this work uh, had some very strange, almost racist uh, take on the comprehension of Africa. So uh, we uh, decided to reverse the, the gaze, the Italian gaze of Pasolini towards the Italian context uh, and actually trying to understand the limits of certain uh, documentary practices in Italy, uh, especially those practices that were uh, engaging with the nat with national, uh, let's say, uh, questions such as the Italian identity or the colonial Italian past and which role he had in the in the construction of, um, of the Italian identity. Um, so uh, this project also led me to develop a sort of a sequel, not a sequel like as a, like, but really to stick to the question of Italianness and trying to understand why it has been shaped like this. And especially in this other project that I had the chance to do in, uh, in Bolzano at Museion as a guest curator in the museum. The project was called Soma Technics, Transparent Travelers and Obscure Nobodies, and was actually a project that tried to look at that region, which is uh, Alto Adige, that was Italianized under fascism, as Aless Alexander Langer suggests, as a priest to look at Europe. You know that we, we know that actually in this country still today, there is an ethnic ethnical tension, really strong ethnical tension. 
uh, and that actually before the 16 uh, years of age, each citizen uh, belonging to the independent province of Bolzano has to affiliate to an ethnical uh, group in the, in the country. And so in this project that saw the participation of artists based in Italy and Austria, uh, the idea was to try to use art in order to um, test actually national identities, especially in a space of border, uh, like uh, uh, like uh, Alto Adige, that actually was shaped by the really strong uh, racial politics of fascism at the time. And this leads me to talk about this last project that actually uh, the participation to School of Waters, uh, which is the Mediterranean Biennale, that was the 19th edition uh, that we had the chance to uh, present last year after several years of uh, standby because of pandemic. And actually this was conceived really as a space of encounter for young artists uh, living and working across Mediterranean region with a very strong importance uh, given to the fact that Mediterranean uh, is always understood as a Eurocentric uh, uh, space because it always looked from Europe. And so the suggestion of this project was to try to look at uh, the Mediterranean from the waters instead of from the lands, and also trying to understand what it means to um, uh, look uh, this very specific political space from, uh, from the waters and how waters that has been organized, especially from uh, colonialism and colonial trucks. And so I just wanted to hand this, um, my presentation by talking about this book that actually came out uh, this year. Uh, and it's a book that I had the chance to create with a very important uh, friend and colleague who's Lucrezia Cipitelli, who is a, a scholar and curator working uh, since several years, years on these questions. The book is called Coloniality and Visual Cultures in Italy, um, critical uh, path between uh, artistic research theoretical practices and pedagogical experimentation. And actually it's um, a work that reunites several uh, contributors. Uh, let's say uh, it, we decided specifically to uh, translate uh, essays that were written in, in English by uh, Italian practitioners on actually this issue. And also it's a sort of an archive of artistic practices that dealt with uh, colonial uh, questions in Italy and also with anti-colonial movements and decolonial methodologies uh, from 91 uh, to uh, 21. And that was actually a book that came out of a, a three years research project. Uh, and I ended up saying that uh, it was important for us uh, as a tool to get in contact with a very specific network of very young artists. Alessandra and Vince are part of this uh, sort of uh, archiving expansion of artists dealing with these uh, questions, but also to prove the fact that every time uh, an artist uh, start a project on Italian colonialism saying that there is a void in Italy about this, um, uh, especially in the recent years, uh, like lately, uh, it's not true, meaning that there is a, a very nourished discourse about this, especially in uh, artists uh, such as Alessandra and Binta, and that has been a journey actually uh, in the last years, uh, often overlooked, but uh, that has also a very uh, important sort of importance because it's methodologically consistent and actually it's a uh, uh, very uh, specific also to our context so the Italian content which we uh, operate through so the idea is really uh, this book actually uh, tries to look especially at visual cultures um, so cultural practices dealing with visuality from uh, uh, commercials, TV, cinema, but also uh, artistic production, and how actually, uh, as Alessandro was saying, colonialism is not just a historical event, but it stays in coloniality, which is a very art, um, social and cultural avant-post to uh, deconstruct. So I just ended up here, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so very much, Simone, and thank you again for to all of you for sharing so much content and with so much generosity. I really appreciate it. So I encourage whoever might have questions for um, our guests to just 
type them in the Q&A section now because we will be wrapping up quite soon. And in the meantime, I just wanted to, I had also a couple of questions that I wanted to share with you. And given that as always time ends up being too short, I'm just gonna cram them into maybe a couple of elements that I wanted to ask you. I'm gonna pack them into one question and then we can go around in, in whichever order, which can be order of presentation or whoever wants to speak first, just please unmute your mic and uh, jump right in. But um, what I wanted to ask you is, um, so we've heard um, from Alessandra talking about sort of her work from a removed position, Simone who's been discussing projects, also his work in France and, and so on and so forth. And so I wanted to ask you how your how you think your respective practices interact with the locales that you root your work in on the one hand, considering again, that some of you are across multiple countries or that you also uh, work in context. And here I think about Joanne, for instance, working in Rome that have really specific characteristics in terms of communities that live there and different positionalities in terms of the, also the geographical, but also the this uh, sort of uh, speculative space that Simone was describing before when talking about Italy. So I wanted to ask you how your work somewhat interacts with these specificities and how it changes as you encounter these different positionalities. And at the same time, I take also the opportunity to ask you about your experience so far working on the, one the hand, on the one hand in the context of Italy and its institutions, and on the other, when working abroad or outside of this, again, speculative object that is, um, that is Italy. So how you're thinking about your work, how you're repositioning or remediating your work across different, these different contexts, and also how do you relate to this more infra in institutional infrastructures where some of the discourse, again, as Simona was saying, gets somewhat swallowed in within bigger, bigger, somehow sometimes tokenizing dynamics or sometimes just dynamics that might or might not correspond to the type of ethical process and work that you put in action when developing your own individual practice. Sorry for the super long question. I'm going to shut up now. Alessandra, I just prompt you to go first if you want. Let's just go in order of presentation so that it's neutral. Sure. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I saw a few questions in the Q and A box. Um, I I will not. I will be brief because I know we are quite late. Uh, just saying that for me, um, going back to certain of the question as well, the work that Joanne was talking about around, for instance, the question of expat. And, you know, like for me, the work is very much informed by this positioning that I have, of course, as I mentioned before, that is very much focused on uh, Italian foreign politics, uh, much more than uh, kind of domestic politics. So, yes, it's looking at certain kind of, you know, history within Italy, but it's always looking at uh, how certain dynamics are recreated in international politics, international relations. So very much when I talk about continuities as well, it's not only to do with coloniality, but also very much to do with neo-colonial politics, for instance. Uh, and in this respect, when I, because I work it, you know, in the UK, but I work a lot in Italy, of course, because of the, the topic of my work. And also because a lot of the time I realized that my work speaks to a certain public, that, you know, especially the first work, negotiating amnesia, you know, retrospectively, then you realize that it's something that you have done, you know, to try and understand why I didn't know anything about colonial history, like being that was saying before, you know, why, you know, this is not part of our education, at least it wasn't, and, you know, how certain um, things are omitted. Um, but at the same time, for me, the other question is, and I think that's where my work is going more and more, and is to do with uh, understanding the Italian imperialism within an international uh, global kind of history of imperialism. Because a lot of the time, you know, Italian imperial and colonial history isn't just marginal within Italy, but is also marginal within uh, other contexts. So for example, I'm based in the UK, so when we're talking about imperial history, you know, it's you know, always informed by British history, but I think it's very important to look at uh, the way that different, you know, imperial um, powers were, um, you know, uh, were relating and working uh, together, but also the certain, uh, with certain 
uh, relations that are at the margins of empires, even within larger empires. And then, of course, for Italy, for me, in Italy, was very important for me to always to come back to is the role that the aggressive Italian colonial politics have had globally, for instance, in uh, creating a domino effect towards the Second World War with the occupation of Ethiopia, or towards the First World War with the occupation of Libya, and to understand uh, that because with the idea that it, you know, this is marginal, it was smaller than, you know, uh, less, ex uh, less successful, you know, and I'm, you know, qu uh, quoting here, uh, than other uh, imperial projects, there's always a tendency of not really understanding its, its full uh, consequences. Thank you, Alessandra. And um, yes, whoever else might want to jump in. And again, not everybody has to answer every single question. We can go in uh, sort of uh, random order with that. Uh, Joan, you're muted. Sorry. Can you hear me? So to me, running a space like Rio, um, I always been very interested in the concept of space. Uh, and I really find uh, really fascinating and uh, important to explore and reflect on uh, what a space is uh, and uh, how a space uh, uh, shapes certain subjectivities and bodies uh, and uh, how a space uh, can be used to reduce inequality by facilitating the access and uh, also the involvement uh, and uh, the production of uh, marginalized communities. So now I'm working on a project I was commissioned by the Orchestra of Transformation and uh, within the Rome Charter Initiative uh, um, and in response to the third sustainable development goal for the UN 2030 agenda, aim at, at reducing inequalities. And uh, to answer to your specific uh, question about uh, our relation with the, um, with the local territory, Rome is a very particular city. It's very big. It's different from other cities, more a city like Turin, Florence, Bologna, or Milan, uh, especially in terms of uh, how these cities are organized in terms of public transformation or simply infrastructure. Uh, so you need to work really hard uh, in Rome to, to get to the results. Um, I, we are now also, um, beside this project that I'm curating for the Orchestra of Transformation, I'm also working on uh, a bigger project uh, that uh, deal with uh, these, these issues that we have uh, discussed uh, about coloniali coloniality, identity, and uh, we are involving uh, um, the international and national artistic scene uh, in order to give a response to what uh, are these uh, topics and how we can uh, address these issues. Thank you. I don't know if anybody wants to jump in and if not, I'll just move on to the next question because now they're starting to come in. Maybe I have something to add, but it's like really uh, quick. Uh, I think, uh, working across several countries is also interesting because um, as I was saying before, certain methodologies and certain discourses can be used in order to understand, um, transported actually in another context in order to, to be used to uh, understand, but also it's super important in order to, uh, it's super important to avoid the, uh, the trick of decontextualization. Whereas, uh, meaning that, um, for example, the, Ita the, the critical discourse about Italian colonialism uh, in France, it's, it's actually uh, uh, tricky because you're not, you're not accountable in a way towards a certain audience. Uh, and I think that also a lot of discussion with Alessandra uh, was also uh, what it means also to do this discussion in front of a certain community that has been colonized by Italians, for example. Uh, so I think it's really, uh, there is always this trick uh, in the art system and in the institution to decontextualize certain critical discourses in order to make them less affected. Um, and so I think this is part of our responsibility to ask for uh, accountability, to ask ourselves uh, for accountability, and also do a huge work in, in, uh, in contextualizing our discourse, not only uh, as a speaker's position, but actually really, as Alessandro was saying before, to which we are, we are talking to, because I also have the impression that 
uh, a general discourse, for example, on post-colonial and anti-colonial issues in Italy right now, it's not useful anymore. Like I was, I was talking about accuracy before. I think it's really, really important that the work uh, can be done with a certain competences and a lot of research, and but also not not academic research, but really a strong grounding um, in the in the in the context. Uh, I would say. So I think we are all very worried about uh, uh, like practices that jump from a topic to another, not because the topic is not relevant, but be because the topic is problematic. Like it's, it doesn't have to be a topic, more a sort of long-term engagement uh, in just other dynamics as also Alessandra was saying before. Thank you, Simone. I'm gonna switch to Binta because Binta, there's also a question for you. So you can, if you want, you can answer this question and the subsequent one at the right at the same time. They're starting to come in to the q and I'll try to be quick so that we can try and answer as many of them as possible. So Binta, someone asks about Black Powerless um, and says the titles, uh, the title of your Black Powerless works turn um, the symbol upside down. Um, can you say, so can you say why the color of the arms is more blue than black? I guess they want to know a little bit about how you're positioning the, the elements, the objects, but also the visuality and the color issue around that. Okay, um, so I made it not in black because for me it was not necessary actually to, um, to work on on the color actually so um for me it was uh, important to start from the meaning behind this symbol and uh, to work with the, the this yeah this material which is very as i said before uh, in contrast with the the notion of power so in this case uh, for me it was not important the color uh, that's why for example for black power uh, powerless the first one uh, I I use the uh, I use the gray shade, and uh, for the other one, I mean uh, the color. I mean the 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 ceiling corner was already colored, so yeah, yeah. I I didn't yeah uh, thought about the the color actually as part of uh, as an important part of the the whole project. Yeah. Thanks, Vinta. Uh, quickly moving on to the next question. Um, someone, uh, Tenli Vic, hi, Tenli asks Binta and Alessandra whether you have plans to exhibit in the US and also asks Simone, you mentioned the tendency to speak in Anglo-American discourse about local histories in Italy. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about programming that can facilitate vernacular discussions and the accessibility of translation. So I don't know if Alessandra, maybe, and Vinta, you guys want to go first about whether you have plans to exhibit and then we move on to Simone quickly. No, actually, no, not yet. I don't know. I would yeah, like <laughs> <Who has? laughs> That's the answer. We are open, I think. But I think for me, especially in relation with the work I've been doing around the fascistization of um, Italian uh, community abroad. So it's certainly, something that I engage with, even if it's not in the work. But uh, yeah, we are open. You were much muted, Ilaria, but I think you were asking. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's a really important question. I mean, it's very relevant. Um, I think it's not just uh, about English, but also, also about uh, French, for example. Uh, also, French literature uh, is a, it's a huge reference point for, for us. But I would say that, for example, the book that we co-curated with uh, Lucrezia um, is a provisional answer also to this, uh, because it tries to look at actually a, a very young generation of uh, researchers and uh, writers that actually wrote important contributions in the recent year and a lot of contributions were written in English actually because also um, research and teaching position for a very specific uh, scholarship are abroad. Um, so the, the accessibility of translation uh, maybe it's a uh, 
it's about that. Um, and also, I think in Italy, there is a huge void of uh, non-European voices uh, dealing with this uh, with this uh, historical topics. So it's not just about um, how the uh, literature, but also the language has been uh, homogenized by uh, Anglo-American literature, but also how it has been uh, totally Western also. And uh, um, yeah, so... I think there is also a very specific history of Italian literature that uh, needs to be um, uh, rediscovered, which is not only in uh, academic institutions. Uh, I mentioned again, Alessandra's work, but she, the project she did uh, called The Bomb to be Reloaded. Uh, you can check on her website. It's a really, really interesting journey into um, dispersed archives of uh, in, in anti-colonial movements who are a body of work uh, that can be mobilized in order to update certain uh, categories and tools that we use to understand uh, our political position in Italy towards specific uh, questions. So it's not just about um, uh, academic bodies of work and how they uh, they are shaped uh, ling language-wise, but also where the knowledge, where anti-colonial knowledge is placed uh, and understood to be placed. So I think it's also a very huge, we were mentioned in class before, it's also another huge struggle. The class factor is never mentioned in Italy. <laughs> uh, so it's actually uh, super important to understand also how um, this discourse was in a, in a way, uh, and we were talking about the essentialized into academic discourse, but actually it's lived and, uh, and still lives in other spaces of our society. So I don't know if I answered, but maybe it's a bit confused, but I think the question is really, uh, it's larger than the language question. Thank you, Simone. Um, I saw some questions that popped up somewhere else. So I'm going to try and also pack them quickly because we don't have time. I think this is the very last um, bunch of questions that we can take. But someone asks about the role of education, education um, that does something and that practices decolonization rather than education uh, that has been cleaned up enough to be called decolonized. And this is one question. And then each one of you can take whichever you feel responds more to your interests and topics. And then someone else um, writes um, by sort of stating her positionality as a white woman who grew up mostly in Africa and experienced displacement and non-belonging and asks whether you feel that there is somewhat a new sense of beginning or sort of a new belonging that, um, that sort of moves work toward a new uh, sense somewhat of civilization and also wonders whether you feel that there is um, uh, sort of a lot of anger over past that over the past that affects the practices or uh, and whether you also think that there's a new form of possible optimism sorry I'm summarizing I'm not reading verbatim I hope I'm not changing too much the meaning inevitably I do a little bit but so education on the one hand and somewhat sort of a new course or what your thoughts are regarding what kind of sort of load is being brought onto the shoulder by practitioners and sort of how to move forward in a way. Okay, I see nobody goes, I go first. Yeah. So I think, well, the, you know, very big question, especially uh, the first question, and I think, uh, for instance, I am very aware of my limitations, and I think it's part of, you know, positioning as well and being quite, you know, um, honest about the, our, you know, my, our limitations and privileges as well. So I think, for instance, what Simone just mentioned in terms of, you know, for instance, or in Italy, we don't really talk about class, but I think in Italy, we don't really talk about positioning as such, you know, uh, that much in general. And I think in question, you know, talking about decolonizing uh, education, I think for me, I know, for instance, I, I do pedagogic project quite a lot and I, where I, 
where I, I, I decided to operate actually is not very new in terms of uh, formats at all. It's just much more a way of sort of um, try to infiltrate the system and bring in inside the conversation because I think the conversation is so, uh, you know, the, 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 there's such a long road ahead and I am uh, on, I do not have the answers to, you know, you know what the decolonized as well education could be, would be in a place like Italy, for instance. Uh, and, you know, so I think sometimes, you know, there, there's different steps and different, you know, strategies that we can uh, come up with uh, to, to try and, you know, and slowly get there. But I'm also very worried about the word decolonization and the way it arrived in Italy, where, you know, we are not even entirely uh, understanding our colonial past and world within, you know, kind of international neo-imperialist kind of projects, like such as, you know, the European Union, for instance. So I think it's, uh, I find it very problematic, this, this just jumping into this kind of trend without really understanding what that word means and what, and the positioning and privileges that people have and the institutions, because also we have to think about, you know, kind of fascist colonial roots of a lot of institutions and what does it mean to decolonize from, uh, you know, from within a fascist building or that, you know, we are so used to inhabit in Italy as well. And um, so, yeah, so, so that's something I would like to put there. Also looking at the other questions around community and new directions for the art world. And I think, yes, you know, there's a lot going on now. Finally, things are moving, but uh, I always try to to throw there a word of caution on terms of how, you know, focusing much more on how we talk and who talks about even, you know, in relation with family heritage, which is something we don't talk about, you know, uh, family wealth that come from fascism, you know, all this kind of colonial history that they're not really parametized, you know, so I think there's, there's a lot there that should be unpacked. Thank you, Alessandra. I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in. Again, either on the first or the second question, and more are popping in, and I'm so sorry we will not be able to address them today. But go ahead, John, of course. Um, so then um, I'm just going to throw in the very last question that we got while I was saying no more questions. Which I think speaks to all of you because someone asks. So they say, I'd like to ask you if, if you feel that there's a growing community of artists and cultural practitioners dealing with similar issues from different angles compared to the past. And if it is getting any easier to tackle these issues, being together with other researchers, artists, anyone such as in the panel today. which sort of circles back to what Simona was talking about, politics of friendship. Anyone? No? I mean, I think my last question was covering, I mean, my last answer was kind of covering this as well. And I think, yes, there are things moving. Uh, you know the different uh, net networks is that the networks they are you know not that official and relate personal relations that come into question as well and um yeah i think you know we'll have to see where this is going <laughs> i think uh, but definitely you know it's, it's good to see more and more uh, initiatives um but I think there's not much understanding of how, you know, before you were different people were talking about, different panelists about token, you know, tokenism. And I think there's a question as well about, uh, uh, you know, over um, burdening as well. Like, you know, at, uh, at the moment of working with Magda that we, we mentioned many times, you know, and she feels like, you know, she was saying how, you know, she's called everywhere you know so and she's like you know kind of exhausted as well so also i think we have to think about how you know as the discourse expand how we go on in creating infrastructures that are sustainable for all and actually care 
uh, and it's not just about, oh, we want to discuss this and the more we see, the better it is, but it's actually creating those infrastructures and structures and community of care as well, uh, rather than just, you know, ticking boxes and, and talking. I do agree with Alessandra. I just don't know if somebody else want, wants to, but, uh, and I'm also worrying, uh, sharing the worry about uh, uh, certain derivations where the where decolonial becomes ornamental, uh, and all actually also certain practitioners become on, ornamental, meaning that they are. We were talking about tokenism, but actually this city of um, jumping on an issue and actually creating an entire system that actually allows you to, for example. Uh, declare yourself a decolonial institution or a decolonial initiative right now in Italy. Um, so I'm really worried about that, and as worried from my very specific positioning, uh, meaning that also with, uh, as Alessandro was saying, um, still don't know what it means to uh, enact a decolonial education, for example, in Italy right now. So um, it's, a, it's a long, it's a long uh, path. And I would just wanted to say that for me, optimism is cruel. And I'm quoting uh, Lauren Berland. Um, I think really that it's not uh, something that will help us to, uh, to uh, work any better. The, <laughs> uh, and I think it's really a sort of uh, projection towards the future that we think we, we don't have any responsibility towards to. And I think like the present work is really, really important. Uh, and engagement is really, really important. And also um, self-criticism is super important right now. Uh, I think Alessandra also talked about the absence of uh, positioning in Italy. Uh, and this is a little bit what I was referring to at the beginning. Um, a sort of uh, lack in the understanding of the structural issues in which we do operate as practitioners, which which is not it doesn't have any, anything uh, has nothing to do with our individual work. So this is where community comes in the fact of being responsible for certain communities, but not just as a rhetoric, um, but really as a uh, the idea is that we have to insist in the present uh, in, instead of. Uh, speculating about uh, like a romantic future where everybody collaborates on the same issue because um, I don't know if I think also about uh, Binta's work and then you Soli is not there and still not there so I mean there is a tough reality uh, though I mean it's there it's factual so um, I would say yeah less optimism more insisting in the present <laughs> this is my uh, yeah, with joy, like meaning that crit critique can also be joy joyful and uh, affirmative, but yeah. Thanks, Simone. So I just want to make a final check to see whether anybody else wanted to jump in or add anything at all. I don't want to cut off anybody. Um, well, first and foremost, I thank all of you really for being so patient and again, generous. It's been almost two years. Uh, two hours. <laughs> um, I also want to acknowledge um, the comments that we received by Stefania, Luciani, by Andrea Vigliani. I will pass them on. I've duly copied them. I'll pass them on to all the speakers so that whoever can sort of take it on, take it on based on her own or their own sensibilities. And, um, and with that being said, I really wanna thank you very much again um, for, for bringing this to the space of this particular uh, institutions, our particular positionalities. And also, as we said, sort of this kind of trying to work across different locales. So I really appreciate also the, not only the sharing, but also sort of the, this constant will to be not fatigued by this conversation, which is, indeed very intense. So really, thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. And hopefully there will be other opportunities to continue to, to do the work as Simone was just saying now, if I understood correctly. So thanks again. And until soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.